Okay. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we yeah. see the slides. Brilliant. So it is a pleasure to welcome virtually, in the absence of a better way, Kalo Jan Lozanov, who will tell us about reheating after inflation and uh, teach us lots of neat tricks about how to get particles out of the cosmological constant or quasi or almost cosmological constant. I should just give him a little bit of uh, background here for your information. Kaloyan was a PhD student at Cambridge, and then uh, I believe he has done a postdoc in, in Germany, in Munich, and now he is working uh, with people at the University of Illinois at Urbana, as you can tell from the slide, uh, continuing his research on this subject and has done actually quite a bit of very nice work. So I'm very happy to welcome him here on everybody's behalf. So without further ado, Kalo and the show is yours. Uh, thank you very, very much, Nemanja, and thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nemanja Zanov, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And today I'll be talking about my works in the context of early universe cosmology. I will touch upon topics like uh, reheating after inflation, phenomenology of gauge fields during and after inflation, and some mechanisms for the generation of primordial gravitational waves. But before I do any of that, let's give you a very brief overview of our current understanding of the history of the universe so that we can put uh, my works into a more concrete context. Okay, so at very early times, the universe was hot and dense. Matter was in the form of plasma. As this plasma cooled with time, the first light elements formed. At some point later on, the temperature of the universe had dropped enough for the first stable atoms to exist. At that moment, photons started to stream freely. And today we observe this afterglow of the Big Bang as the cosmic microwave background or the CMB. The CMB is almost completely uniform. Crucially, it contains tiny variations in its temperature. These temperature fluctuations reflect tiny variations in the matter density of the universe at the time of the emission of the CMB. Over time, and under the influence of gravity, these matter density fluctuations grew. Dense regions in the universe were getting denser, and eventually the first galaxies, stars, and planets formed. So this picture of the universe from fractions of a second after the Big Bang until today is a scientific fact, and Nobel Prizes have been worth for its development, including the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics. Of course, there is growing evidence for an earlier stage of cosmic inflation, during which the universe underwent rapid accelerated expansion. Basically, it seems more and more likely that the tiny density fluctuations imprinted on the CMB originated as microscopic quantum fluctuations stretched to cosmic sizes during inflation. However, despite all these great successes of modern cosmology, we still have an inadequate understanding of how exactly to connect these two important eras in cosmic history, namely the eras of cosmic inflation and primordial nucleosynthesis. Of course, intermediate stages, such as the QCT phase transition and the electroweak symmetry breaking phase transition, are increasingly well understood from accelerator experiments, such as the one at CERN. But still, there's this huge range of energy and time scales that is poorly constrained and poorly understood. In particular, we still don't know what exactly the universe looked like soon after the end of inflation, how energy was transferred, and the universe was eventually populated with matter. So what do we know? Well, according to the inflationary paradigm, the universe at the end of inflation was cold, virtually empty of particles, and dominated by the approximately homogeneous infoton field. Later on, this infoton field must have decayed into other, more familiar forms of matter radiation, eventually yielding the particle content of the standard model and perhaps dark matter. These more familiar forms of matter radiation must have eventually thermalized in order to recover the successful Big Bang nucleosynthesis scenario. So the transition of the universe between the supercooled state at the end of inflation and the hot and thermal radiation in the state required for nucleosynthesis, the transition between these two states is called reheating. And in the standard picture, reheating begins after the end of slow or inflation as the infoton begins to oscillate about the minimum of its potential. The exact details of the infoton decays into other species of matter depend on the form of the potential near the minimum, 
and on the coping significant water fields. Originally, reheating was studied as a perturbative process in which individual infoton particles were assumed to decay independently of each other. Decay rates and rates were calculated in the usual manner using Feynman diagrams. However, later studies emphasized on the importance of collective non-perturbative resonances in the early transfer of energy from the infoton field to the field it is coupled. Such resonances require a non-perturbative description, to which we now turn very briefly. Okay, so let's consider a simple example in which, an, uh, in which the infoton is coupled to a light subdominant daughter field chi. Since the infoton is oscillating about the minimum of its potential, the interaction term here is periodic. And because of this periodicity, something known as Floquet theory allows us to write down the solutions for this for the individual Fourier modes of chi in this exponential form. And if the real part of this Floquet exponent is not zero, we have an unstable solution, exponentially growing with time, which is a manifestation of non perturbative or resonant perturbation of chi particles. Here shown the real part of the Floquet exponent characterizing the particle production rate as a function of the amplitude of infant oscillations and the wave number of the daughter field. If a given Fourier mode of chi lies in any of these instability bands, it grows exponentially with time. Of course, such rapid exponential growth cannot proceed forever. Eventually, the daughter particles back react on the infoton condensate and fragment it. And the subsequent evolution of the combined infoton daughter field system is complicated and nonlinear. So, as you can see, um, a timeline of reheating begins to emerge. It consists of several distinct stages. Typically, at the end of inflation, parametric resonances or preheating often dominate the early transfer of energy from the infoton field to the field it is coupled to. Um, once preheating is over due to back reaction fragmentation, we enter the nonlinear regime where we can get, for example, non trivial field configurations such as solitons. Late stage reheating typically involves the perturbative decays of the remnant infoton particles just to ensure the completion of transfer of energy. And this typically happens before the universe achieves thermal equilibrium necessary for nucleosynthesis. Looking for observational signatures of reheating can be difficult since reheating occurs after inflation and the complicated dynamics on small scales is concealed by the later nonlinear evolution of cosmic structure. The thermal state required for nucleosynthesis also hides information about earlier times. Nevertheless, reheating can have a number of observational implications. Um, here is a short, most likely incomplete list of them. Uh, perhaps the most important observational consequence of reheating is the expansion history effect. Essentially, the duration of reheating affects how we connect inflationary predictions to CMP observables, and we have to say more about it shortly. The rich dynamics of reheating could have left uh, many potentially observable remnants, such as stochastic gravitational backgrounds, non gaussianity solitons. Reheating can even sometimes help us constrain or even rule out some high energy physics models on the basis of overproduction of cosmic defects, incomplete decays of lymphoton condensate, or production of primordial black holes, etc. So let me conclude this uh, very brief review with some directions for future work in the field of reheating. On the more theoretical side, it is important to develop and study the details of more realistic post-inflationary models, including not only scalar fields, as has been typical, but also, for instance, abelian non-abelian gauge fields, as well as fermions. Of course, this poses both theoretical and numerical challenges. For instance, the intricate gauge environment interactions and gauge constraints can lead to great technical complications when one tries to study such uh, uh, gauge field models of reheating with a computer. And of course, ultimately, the impact on different cosmological observables in realistic uh, post-inflationary scenarios has to be considered. Okay, now uh, let me move on to my works. Let's start with a series of studies of the equation of state of the universe soon after the end of inflation. Okay, so 
what is the equation of state after inflation? To answer this question, we study the post-inflation expansion history of the universe in single field models with infotone potential of this form. Some parallel near the minimum and appropriate flattening away from it to be consistent with observations. Here is a short list of references to works which also provide a theoretical motivation for this form of the infotone potential. Um, for any such infotone potential, there are only two relevant features, the power n near the minimum and the scale m where the potential starts to flood. Um, while we allow ourselves for quite generous shifts of the infotone potential, we limit ourselves to the cases where the self-couplings of the infotone dominate over its couplings to other fields. So within this framework, we find the following very simple answer to the question. We find that at sufficient late times, the equation state is zero if n is one or a third if n is greater than one. Note that we can achieve radiation donation easily, even without coupling the infotone to additional light fields. And in the rest of this section of the talk, I'll try to briefly explain the independence of this result from the value of scale m, the special nature of n equal to one, and the generic behavior for n greater than one. Note that n need not be an integer. Okay, so let's begin with the dynamics of the infoton. We adopt the standard picture in which after the end of solar inflation, the infoton begins to oscillate about the bottom of its potential. If we assume that the infoton remains homogeneous, then the amplitude of infoton oscillations decays uh, with time or scale factor in the usual manner. We can then turn our attention to the equation state parameter W, defined as the ratio of the pressure and energy density, written out explicitly here. Given all that, we can calculate the mean equation state during the oscillatory stage. Uh, here's the expression, n minus one over n plus one. It's a well-known result, and its only requirement is for the infoton to remain homogeneous while oscillating. What we show in our work is that the homogeneous assumption may not always hold. Instead, instead uh, we show that the oscillations of the infoton condensate can resonantly amplify its own spatial homogeneities, eventually into its complete fragmentation, as shown in the video. As you can see, the actual dynamics can be highly nonlinear, very different from the homogeneous case. And the question is, how does all of this affect the equation state? So here shown the evolution of the equation state for two different values of the power n, n equal to one on the left, and some value of n greater than one on the right. On the vertical axis, we have the equation state parameter W, on the horizontal axis, the number of efforts of expansion after the end of inflation delta began. So time runs as usual from left to right in both plots. In blue, we have the expected homogeneous equation of state. And in black, we have the equation of state for radiation domination, the radiation equals one. And now in orange and green, we give the actual evolution of the equation of state. The data is from representative flood simulations. In orange, we have the equation of state for a case when the scale m is much less than Planck, and in green when the scale m is comparable to Planck. In the orange case, we say that the resonance is efficient since it leads to the complete fragmentation of the infoton condensate within less than an fold after the end of inflation. Afterwards, W quickly settles to zero if n is one or a third if n is greater than one. On the other hand, in the green case, we say that the resonance is inefficient since the condensate can oscillate for very long times, for many faults. In fact, if n is one, the condensate never fragments due to self resonance, whereas if n is greater than one, the condensate eventually fragments, and that will quickly settle to one third, almost in a step-like manner. So as you can see, there is a number of different regimes, different scenarios, and we're going to consider each one of these in turn very briefly. So we start with the radiation domination cases corresponding to n greater than one, since those have the most important observational implications. Okay, uh, we start with the linear regime during which the oscillations of the infoton condensate can non-perturbatively or resonantly amplify its own spatial homogeneities. So here shown the real part of the flock exponent characterizing the particle production rate as a function of the amplitude of infoton oscillations and the dimension as physical wave number kappa. 
little m, the effective mass is defined down here. So in the figure, you can see a broad low momentum instability band in a series of narrow bands going all the way to a bottom of the chart. The expansion of the universe can be now incorporated qualitatively. Recall that in an expanding universe, the amplitude of infinite oscillations decays with time or scale factor. The dimensionless physical wave number kappa also varies with scale factor. Hence, a given coming, a given coming mode k flows across this chart through a number of instability bands as time goes by and the universe expands. Now, if we set the scale m to be comparable to m Planck, the amplitude of infinite oscillations redshifts very quickly as time goes by and the universe expands. And only the first narrow instability band at the bottom of the chart is expected to play an important role. Since convict modes will be redshifted very quickly towards the bottom, and we'll cross the first narrow band from right to left, we expect to see significant particle production in a narrow convict band whose peak shifts with time towards higher convict wave numbers. Uh, let's consider the actual evolution of the infoton power spectrum. Here on the horizontal axis, we have the combing wave number in units of some arbitrary constant mass scale M0. The data I'm about to show you is from a representative LAT simulation capturing the nonlinear dynamics of the infoton field and the background expansion of the universe. So indeed, initially, we observe particle production in a narrow combing band whose peak shifts with time towards higher combing wave numbers. This is followed by the generation of series of secondary peaks due to nonlinear scattering. The growth is eventually shut off by back reaction. The peaks smear out and late time spark cascades forward towards the UV and the field is virilized and evolves in a turbulent like manner. So as you can see, our LAT simulations confirm the qualitative predictions of our linear analysis. However, they also take us a step further since the, they capture the full nonlinear dynamics of the infoton field. Okay, so now let's increase the value of the power n from 1.5 to 2. Um, the Floquet chart remains qualitatively the same. We still have the broad low momentum band and the series of narrow bands going all the way to the bottom of the chart. Uh, the expansion of the universe can be again incorporated qualitatively. This time we end up with vertical flow lines. This is because the product of the scale factor and little m is approximately constant for quartic mu. Uh, if we again set the scale m to be comparable to m Planck, again, the amplitude uh, redshifts very quickly. And again, only the first now band plays uh, an important role. Since this time, coming modes flow vertically downwards, we expect to see significant particle production in a now coming band whose peak does not shift sideways. The now peak in the infoton power spectrum should stay fixed in coming space. Our LAT simulations verify this claim. Uh, the vertical dashed line here lies uh, right in the middle of the first narrow band. And indeed, initially, we observe particle production in a narrow coming band whose peak does not shift sideways. This is again followed by the generation of the series of secondary peaks due to the nonlinear scattering. Uh, the growth is eventually shut off by back reaction fragmentation. The peaks smear out and power cascades slowly towards the UV at later times. Uh, we can increase the value of the power end further from two to three. The Floki chart is qualitatively the same. And uh, we can again incorporate the expansion of the universe. This time we end up with such flow lines. And if we again set the scale to be comparable to M Planck, again, the amplitude decays very quickly. And again, only the first now band plays a major role. Since this time, coming modes get redshifted very quickly towards the bottom and cross the first now band from left to right, we expect to see significant particle production in a narrow coming band whose peak shifts with time towards lower coming wave numbers. Our lot simulations again verify this prediction. Uh, initially, we observed the particle production in the narrow coming band whose peak shifts with time towards lower coming wave numbers as predicted by our uh, linear analysis. Uh, this again eventually followed by a generation of series of secondary peaks due to non-linear scattering of particles from the first narrow band. And the growth is eventually shut off by back reaction and fragmentation. And at late times, again, power cascades slowly towards the UV. Now let's keep the value of the power n fixed equal to 3. And let's set the scale n to be much less than n Planck. In this case, the amplitude of infoton oscillations decays very slowly as time goes by and the universe expands. 
and we expect the broad low momentum instability band to play a major role. Since this time, convoying modes flow very slowly along the lines, we're essentially stuck somewhere up here. We expect to see significant particle production in a broad convoying band. Let's see what our LAT simulations actually give us. Indeed, initially, we observe particle production in a broad convoying band. The growth is rapidly shut off by Beck reaction. However, the broad peak in the power spectrum stays there for some time, even after Beck reaction and fragmentation, but eventually goes away. And at late times, again, power cascades stored towards the UV and the fluid is realized and turbulent. So what's happening here? Why do we have this broad peak in the power spectrum staying there for some time, even after Beck reaction, but eventually going away? And also what's happening with the other power spectrum? Well, for the M much less than M plan case, the case on the left and the case I just showed you, the infoton forms highly overdense field configurations, which can dominate the energy density of the universe. However, these objects are of transient nature. They decay away quickly, as you can see in the video, leaving behind them a completely fragmented infoton field. And that's why the broad peak in the power spectrum eventually went away. And at late times, we find numerically that the fluid is realized and turbulent, and most importantly, has kinetic and gradient energies equal to each other and much greater than the potential energy, implying a radiation-like equation of state. On the other hand, for the M comparable to M Planck case, the case on the right, and the case for the other power spectra, we observe slow but steady particle production due to a first now instability band, eventually leading to a complete fragmentation of the infoton condensate. However, this time without the formation of any transient overdense field configurations. But again, at sufficiently late times, we find that the field is realized, evolves in a turbulent like matter, and most importantly, has kinetic and gradient energies approximately equal to each other and much greater than the potential energy, again, implying a radiation-like equation of state. So as you can see, no matter what the value of the scale M is in terms of M Planck, we always end up with a radiation-like equation of state as long as the power N is greater than one. Note that we can achieve radiation nation easily, even without coupling the infoton to additional light fields. This uh, simple result significantly bounds the expansion history of reheating, and this bound can be then transferred on predictions for CMB observables, such as the spectral index NS and the tensor to scalar ratio R. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. In any of these two parameter models of inflation, NS and R depend only on the values of the scale M, power N, and N star. N star is the usual number of efforts of expansion before the end of inflation when cosmologically random perturbations crossed outside the Hubble radius. Typically, the value of N star is quite uncertain. And the uncertainty comes from the fact that we don't know how long it took the universe to make the transition between the end of inflation and radiation domination. Just to get some idea about the uncertainties in N star, here's the typical range that is commonly used to account for this reheating rate of uncertainties. And based on our analysis, the uncertainties in N star can be reduced significantly. Uh, let's see how this happens. Here's the full expression used to calculate N star. Only the last term depends on the expansion history of reheating. Our analysis allows us to calculate delta big N radiation, the number of efforts of expansion between the end of inflation and radiation domination. We know from our analysis how long it takes for an isolated infloton to fragment a rich radiation domination. Here's the expression. Now, if we allow for couplings of the infoton to additional light fields, delta N radiation can be only reduced. Hence, this expression should be taken as an upper bound on delta N radiation. Our analysis also allows to calculate the mean equation of state between the end of inflation and radiation domination. Here's how the equation of state actually varies to a very good approximation. It evolves in a step-like manner. Our LAT simulations have verified. So using these results, we can now calculate the expected values for NS and R for different values of the scale M and power N, even accounting for uncertainties due to couplings of the infoton to additional light fields. So let's consider now some specific models of inflation. Let's start with the popular alpha tractor T models in which the infoton potential profile goes as tanch raised to some power. Here are our predictions for R and NS for three different values of the power N given with these three thick red, orange, and green lines. 
and the width of each line corresponds to the uncertainties due to couplings of lay photon to additional attitudes. Now for comparison, we give the standard predictions for R and NS with these three broad red, orange, and green bands. The width of each band corresponds to the standard reheating rate uncertainties. And now for comparison, we give the two sets of predictions together. As you can see, our analysis can indeed help reduce the uncertainties in predictions for R and NS from the standard broad bands to the thick lines that we have. Uh, let's change the potential now. Our results apply also to asymmetric potential profiles. So let's consider the alpha attract emulus in which the potential goes like that. Again, here are our predictions with our uncertainties, the standard predictions with the standard uncertainties. Again, the uncertainties have been reduced significantly from the standard broadbands to the thick lines that we have. Uh, our analysis can be also applied to parallel potential profiles. So let's consider a monodromy like uh, potential, which goes as phi raised to some power q far away from the minimum. We can set q to one half, for example, so the slow inflation is realized by square root of phi. Again, our predictions without uncertainty, standard predictions, standard uncertainties. Again, the uncertainties can be reduced significantly. Uh, just for fun, we can also set q to one, so the slow inflation is realized along a linear slope. Uh, again, our predictions with uncertainties, standard predictions, standard uncertainties, and the bottom line is that our analysis indeed helps reduce the uncertainties in predictions for R and TNS from the standard broad bands to the thick lines that we have. Okay, now let's quickly move on to the matter domination cases corresponding to n equal to one, or in other words, to quadratic minimum. Uh, most people may say that this is the most natural case since most minima in nature are quadratic. So here, uh, the Floquet chart, the stability chart, does not remain qualitatively the same. While we still have a broad long momentum instability band, we don't have a series of narrow bands going all the way to the bottom of the chart. Uh, this makes perfect sense since at the bottom of the chart, we have an M squared phi squared theory, a free theory, and therefore we don't expect to see any instabilities due to nonlinear interactions. Um, the expansion of the universe can be again incorporated qualitatively. And if we set the scale M to be comparable to M Planck, again, the amplitude of infant oscillations decays very quickly as time goes by and the universe expands. Since this time, convict modes flow very quickly towards the bottom of the chart. And since there are no instability bands at the bottom of the chart, we don't expect to see significant particle production. Our LAT simulations verify this uh, qualitative prediction. Initially, we observe some particle production. However, the growth is rapidly shut off by the expansion of the universe. And late times, there aren't enough particles to cause any back reaction. So the infoton condensate remains intact. Uh, now, if we set the scale M to be much less than M Planck, the amplitude of infoton oscillations decays very slowly as time goes by and the universe expands. And uh, since this time, uh, Coving modes flow very slowly along the flow lines. We're essentially stuck somewhere up here. We expect to see significant particle production in a broad coming band. The broad momentum instability band plays a major role. So let's see what our LAT simulations uh, actually give us. Indeed, initially we observe particle production in a broad coming band. And the growth is rapidly stopped by back reaction and fragmentation. However, the broad peak in the power spectrum stays there for the entire duration of the simulation. It never goes away. It only gets slowly shifted towards higher coming wave numbers as time goes by and the universe expands. So what's happening here? Why do we have this broad peak in the power spectrum staying there for the entire duration of the simulation, never going away? And also what's happening with the air power spectrum? Well, for the M much less than M plan case, the case on the left and the case I just showed you, the infoton forms highly lower dense field configurations known as oscillons. You can think of oscillons as solitons. They're very long lived, very stable objects. They never decay for duration of our lot simulations. That's why the broad peak in the power spectrum never went away. And since oscillons are very stable and they behave as pressure as dust, they can lead to long periods of matter dominated static expansion. On the other hand, for the M comparable to M Planck case, the case on the right and the case for the other power spectrum, 
uh, the particle production is inefficient. It is shut off by the expansion of the universe before it can cause any back reaction. So in this case, the infoton condensate remains intact and keeps oscillating about uh, the quadratic mu of its potential. Again, implying a matter-like equation of state. So as you can see, no matter what the value of the scale m is in terms of m Planck, we always end up with a matter-like equation of state as long as the power is exactly equal to one, as long as the minimum is quadratic. So in these cases, in order to ensure the eventual approach to radiation domination and the successful completion of heating, we need to explicitly introduce couplings of lymphoton to additional light fields. And this unfortunately can introduce great model dependence in our predictions. Nevertheless, we may consider this in the near future. Our simple self resonance scenario can have a number of other observation implications. For instance, we can get stochastic gravitation waves out of the fragmentation of nephoton condensate. Here shown the evolution of the gravitation wave power spectrum during and after the formation of the infoton oscillons. Time runs from red to purple. Um, on the vertical axis, we have the gravitational energy density normalized by the critical energy density of the universe today. And on the horizontal axis, we have the frequency of the gravitational wave signal, again, evaluated today. Uh, this figure is for the alpha tractor T models. So the infoton potential profile here is star squared. And please note the prominent peak in the gravitational wave power spectrum. Here's the same plot, but for the transient objects, the objects we get when the infoton potential minimum is not quadratic, but something steeper. And this particular figure is for a quartic minimum, again, for the alpha tractor T models. So the infoton potential here is, the infoton potential profile here is touched to the fourth. And again, please note the prominent peak in the gravitational F power spectrum. We have a very good parametric understanding of the location of this peak basically of its mean frequency and height. And here shown the full range of gravitational waves we can get out of the formation of infoton oscillons. We cannot get any further to the left in this figure unless we assume that the oscillon scalar field uh, is a spectator field. Basically for the infoton field, uh, um, for, for the infoton field, uh, the parametric resonance here is inefficient. It is shut off by the expansion of the universe. However, this is not necessarily the case for a spectator field. On the other hand, we cannot move any further to the right in this figure, since here uh, the field mode functions, which get resonantly amplified, have initial energies, vacuum energies already comparable or even greater than the background energy. The second bound is quite hard. It cannot be overcome even if we assume. Um, a spectator field instead of the infoton field to play the role of the oscillon scalar field. In fact, this second bout is quite generic. It applies to all sorts of reheating scenarios featuring the resonant amplification of field modes, not necessarily scalar field modes, but also gauge field modes, fermionic field modes, etc. Nevertheless, there is some hope left for observations. Uh, these bounds are derived under the assumption of the immediate onset of radiation domination after oscillon formation. If we assume something faster than radiation domination, say matter domination, then these bounds get translated in this direction. Whereas if we assume something slower than radiation domination, say kinetic domination, then these bounds get translated in this direction. And of course, the amount of translation depends on the exact details of the expansion history between oscillon formation and the eventual onset of uh, radiation domination. Another interesting application of our simple self-resonance scenario is to some new early dark energy models meant to resolve the so-called Hubble tension. Uh, these scenarios assume an oscillating scalar about a parallel minimum around the time of recombination. And currently, Mustafa Amin, Tristan Smith, and I are looking to the nonlinear dynamics of uh, such early dark energy fields. Uh, on the other hand, if we make uh, the infoton field, a complex scalar, the oscillons we observe can decay into cubos, which are infinitely stable and therefore can serve as dark matter candidates. If we further slightly break the global U1 symmetry of the complex infoton, we can get biogenesis. In this uh, broad class of uh, biogenesis models, uh, the nonlinear dynamics at the end of inflation can generate an asymmetry between the number of infotons and antiphotons. 
And this asymmetry can be then transferred into the observed baryon asymmetry in our universe today, if you simply allow for the inflaton to decay into baryons at some point after inflation. And the other works of mine I want to mention very briefly are on reheating and gauge fields. <clears throat> Uh, in this particular work, I study the evolution of abelian and non-abelian gauge fields and metric perturbations uh, during inflation preheating. So I basically carried out the linear analysis in models with a charged inflaton. Such models are well motivated since such interactions appear in the standard model itself. The analysis of particle production uh, during uh, preheating is slightly more complicated than the one in the usual scalar field models of preheating, since here we have to worry about additional gauge constraints. Uh, but still, we managed to carry out the stability analysis, the flock analysis, and we showed for the first time that both transfers and longitudinal gauge field modes can be amplified at similar rates, resolving some minor confusions in the literature. And currently, I'm developing a lattice code to study the subsequent nonlinear dynamics after back reaction. Here is one of my runs in which I show the formation of cosmic strings from preheating. Uh, the abelian version of the code is called GFIRE. It was released a little over a year ago. It has a number of uh, novel unique features. Basically, once you see the code, all of your hopes and dreams will come true. So please check it out. And currently I'm trying to extend the abelian version of the code to study non-abelian problems, such as non-abelian backgrounds during uh, inflation, which are known to give rise to non-trivial tensor metric perturbations and strong tensor non gaussianities And on this non-abelian project, I'm collaborating with my previous employer, Ichiro Komatsu, and members of uh, his uh, group at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. Um, another increasingly popular gauge field toy model these days is the so-called chromonatural setup, in which an axion-like field is coupled to a non-abelian SU2 gauge field by churn simons interaction term. The unique feature of all of these models is the fact that both the axion and the gauge field can develop simultaneously non-trivial vacuum expectation values consistent with the symmetries of the FRW. In some models, the axion can play the role of the inflaton. The simplest models have been ruled out by observations. However, minimal natural extensions can still stay them. In other scenarios, both the axion and the gauge field can be a part of a spectator sector during inflation. Um, regardless of which scenario we choose, arguably the most exciting feature of all of these models is the fact that there is always a linear coupling between the tensor-like perturbations in the gauge fields and the tensor metric perturbations. Basically, the non-trivial gauge field background provides a linear coupling between the gauge field perturbation and the gravitational waves. And this linear coupling can significantly enhance the gravitational wave signal from inflation. The detection of this enhanced gravitational wave signal of inflation is one of the main targets of upcoming uh, CMB and gravitational wave experiments. Okay, so as you can see, this non trivial gauge field background can have very exciting observational consequences. However, one may worry about possible pathologies. One may worry if this strong gauge field background can lead to the significant production of uh, charged particles via the Schwinger mechanism. And if these charged particles can then back react on the gauge field background, completely destroying it in its exciting observational implications. So to address this concern, we study the two most natural models featuring charged particles. In the first model, we study the production of charged scalars on the SU2. So we basically study the evolution of a Higgs doublet and when its back reaction the gauge field background becomes important. In the second extension, we study the production of charged fermions on the SU2. So we basically study the evolution of a Dirac doublet and when its back reaction the gauge field background becomes important. In this second extension, we also added a natural coupling between the axion and the fermions. And uh, in this figure of ours, we summarize the back reaction on the gauge field background in all spectator models. On the vertical axis, we have the fraction of total energy stored in the gauge field background. On the horizontal axis, we have the effective coupling strength between the gauge field background and its charged daughter fields. As usual, the shaded uh, regions are ruled out on the basis of theoretical or observational considerations, and the white region is still allowed, still viable. 
the magenta line and the area underneath is for back reaction due to GH perturbations. The orange line and the area underneath is for back reaction due to Dirac particles. And the dark red dashed line and the area underneath is for back reaction due to the Higgs on the gauge root background. So as you can see, the Schwinger effect is not a threat for the chrome natural setup. It doesn't lead to back reaction in the observation and theoretical out regions in parameter space, which is great news for the chrome natural community. And the last work of mine I want to mention very briefly is on uh, fuzzy vector dark matter. Uh, but before I do that, let me again give you a very brief overview of our current understanding of dark matter so that we can put this work into a more concrete context. Okay, so we still don't know what dark matter is. We only have indirect evidences for its existence. We have indirect evidences for this, the existence of dark matter from uh, galaxy rotation curves. Uh, cold dark matter has been also extremely successful in predicting large scale structure and is in excellent agreement with the CMB. Nevertheless, we still don't know what's the mass of the particle which possibly makes up dark matter. There is a huge range of possibilities for the nature and the mass of the dark matter particle. For instance, we can have um, primordial black hole dark matter, uh, cold dark matter with particle mass of about one GV or greater, warm dark matter with particle mass of about one GV or greater, and of course, ultralight dark matter. And the main constraint on all these dark matter candidates is the fact that uh, they must behave as cold dark matter on large scales. And uh, now we're going to focus on the lower end of this dark matter particle mass spectrum, a scenario known as fuzz dark matter. So in our work, we assume that uh, fuzz dark matter is cold and bosonic, which allows it to form a Bose-Einstein condensate in the real universe. Since the, fuzz dark mark, uh, since the fuzzy dark matter particle is ultralight, its wave-like properties are manifest on macroscopic scales. Uh, for instance, a first dark matter particle belonging to a dark matter, dark matter halo of about 100 million solar masses has a de Broglie wavelength of about one kiloparsec. Um, so as we said, first dark matter behaves uh, like cold dark matter on large scales. First dark matter reproduces the successes of cold dark matter. However, on small scales, first dark matter is exotic. It behaves differently from cold dark matter. And since cold dark matter faces a number of challenges, some may say problems on small scales, the hope is that the exotic small scale behavior of first dark matter can resolve these uh, challenges, these problems of cold dark matter. And uh, some of the small scale problems of cold dark matter include issues with the abundance and statistics of uh, dwarf galaxies. Basically, cold dark matter predicts more and heavier dwarf galaxies than what we have actually observed. Uh, there are also issues with the uh, density profiles at the centers of dark matter halos. Cold dark matter predicts uh, much greater densities than what we have actually measured or inferred. And first dark matter can provide solutions to all these problems. Since it is difficult to have gravitational collapse on scales shorter than the de Broglie scale, first dark matter suppresses the formation of small scale structure. First dark matter predicts uh, the formation of fewer dwarf galaxies and virtually no formation of density cusps at the centers of dark matter halos. So now let's consider some concrete models of uh, first dark matter. Normally, first dark matter is assumed to be a spin zero field, minimally coupled to gravity with uh, negligible self-interactions. Note that this theory is relativistic. However, since first dark matter is uh, cold and uh, weakly gravitating, a non-relativistic description is sufficient to capture its dynamics. Uh, and now we're going to quickly sketch how to derive this non-relativistic limit of uh, scalar first dark matter. Um, we start from the plane Gordon equation of motion, which can be written out explicitly in this way. Uh, to make further progress, we have to assume something about the metric. We assume Minkowski space time for simplicity. Next, we decompose the real scalar field phi into a complex wave function like object psi, and we factor out the primary time dependence. Uh, one can show that uh, the non-relativistic limit corresponds to psi dot being much less than m psi. 
uh, one can show this equivalent to saying that the ratio of the Laplacian and m squared uh, being much less than one, or in other words, that the typical momentum in the problem are much less than the rest mask. So having assumed all that, one can show a two-link order in these small quantities, the Klein gordon equation reduced to this schrodinger like equation. Um, we can now add uh, scalar perturbations to the metric to incorporate gravity. Uh, again, they compose phi into a complex psi and factor of the primary time dependence, assume non relativistic dynamics, and weak gravity. And now one can show it to linger in these small quantities. The Klein Gordon equation reduces this Schrodinger like equation. In addition to that, the Einstein equations give us this Poisson like equation and a condition of phi and psi. Uh, we can also add a scale factor to account for the FRW expansion of the universe. Again, uh, decompose phi into a complex psi and factor of the primary time dependence, assume non relativistic dynamics with gravity and slow expansion. If the last condition was not true, uh, phi would have not behaved as uh, dark matter. And uh, now one can show a Turing order in these small quantities. Uh, the Klein Gordon equation reduced the Schrodinger like equation with some extra terms due to a non trivial metric. In addition to that, the Einstein equations give us this Poisson equation and a condition of time psi. Okay, now let's move on to fuzzy vector dark matter. This type of theories has not been studied extensively. And in our work, we assume a massive spin one field, minimally coupled to gravity, to play the role of uh, fuzzy vector dark matter. Uh, this class of theories is also known as the Proca theory. And much to my surprise, my work was the first one to derive the non relativistic quick gravity limit of the Proca theory. So let's see how this happens. Again, we start from the classical equation of motion, which can be used to define a conserved uh, quantity. The application of the covariant derivative uh, then gives us an additional equation. One can think of this second equation as a constraint on the solutions to the classical equation of motion. So now we have to solve this system of two equations. We start by substituting the second equation into a first one, which gives us an expression of this form and which can be written out in this way. I apologize about the messiness. Uh, the first two terms are identical to the Ben Gordon equation we had for uh, scalar force dark matter. However, the third and fourth terms are due to the vector nature of the AMU object. And since the, these third and fourth terms are of uh, gravitational origin, they come with extra space-time derivatives on the metric. And because of that, they are suppressed in the weak gravity non-relativistic limit, as we will see in a second. Okay, now to make further progress, we again assume something about, well, we again assume uh, FRW with uh, scalar metric perturbations. Uh, we decompose the real AMU objects uh, into complex uh, wave function like object, calligraphic AMU, and we factor out the primary time dependence. We assume uh, non relativistic dynamics, weak gravity, and slow expansion. And now one can show the Turing order in these small quantities, the space like components of the equation of motion reduced to three identical copies of the Schrodinger equation we had for scalar force dark matter. In addition to that, the constrained equation reduces to this simple expression. In addition to that, the Einstein equations give us this Poisson equation and a condition of phi psi. Uh, from the second box, one can see that there is a hierarchy between the time-like and space-like components. Basically, the time-like component is suppressed with respect to space-like components by one factor of the ratio of the spatial derivative and the rest mass. And because of that, in the Poisson equation, only the space-like components appear and the time-like component doesn't appear. Um, now, just for completeness, or just for fun, we cannot vector perturbations to the metric. This doesn't change anything. Given the same assumptions, we arrive at the same system of equations. In addition to that, we have unsourced vector metric perturbations to link order in the small quantities. Uh, this makes sense since uh, vector metric perturbations always come with extra space-time derivatives with respect to the scalar metric perturbations. Okay, so to sum up, we've shown that the non-relativistic with gravity limit of the Proca theory is uh, three identical copies of scalar first dark matter. Now one can use this uh, 
system of equations to solve for the uh, solitonic cores of the fuzzy vector dark matter halos. One can also use this system of equations to run some fuzzy vector dark matter simulations. And here I would like to share with you some very preliminary uh, fuzzy vector dark matter simulations. So here we are solving the Schrodinger Poisson system in a non expanding background, and we are using arbitrary initial conditions for the fuzzy vector dark matter components. However, in the near future, we plan to run some uh, fuzzy vector dark matter simulations with realistic uh, initial conditions uh, coming from well motivated uh, reheating scenarios featuring the production of fuzzy vector dark matter particles. And since I'm probably uh, running out of time, I will simply leave it there with my conclusions. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much for a very comprehensive review of many things. So, you know, applause to you or maybe even whatever it is, the virtual clap. There you go. Okay, anybody, any questions? So I, I actually have a, a kind of a question slash a comment. Yes. You know, when you were showing some of these examples of inflation, actually, I mean, of course, it's it's kind of difficult to 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 be up to date given all of these things. Um, these these simple monodromy models, flattened monodromy models, and so on and so forth, are now claimed to be, shall we say, in danger of exclusion by the most recent bicep data. And I think your your plot sort of show that as well, right? I mean. The one thing that I want to mention is that actually you can, th there are several different things. Um, well, personally, my comment is I, I think that concluding that they need to be thrown out at this point is premature because of uh, various things you can do. Uh, you know, it, one, thing that, one thing that's becoming obvious is that, um, obvious is a difficult word. Let me say compelling, okay, is that if inflation is the way how the universe was born, it's not going to be simple. <laughs> so there are there are therefore you know some some I think these these aesthetic criteria that people liked in the past, which is you know simple, long, smooth, blah blah, mm -hmm. probably need to be taken with a, with a, with a, with an amount of reserve. So you can actually fix this plot, the, this prediction in terms of bringing your curves, for example, at least for for. You know the 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 CMB predictions for the power and so on and so forth somewhat by assuming that inflation had been interrupted, so it happened at some stages. So as a result, you know your potential then is not actually one long smooth thing that you fix at sixty folds before the end or at the exit and then run smoothly, but you build them with several different steps, and that actually changes this. Another thing which is very curious. I, I, far from certain, far from certain. I think this one I take with more reserve because it's it's connected with this H not uncertainty, or rather rather tension. Okay. Yes. But I, I was very curious to notice that almost all proposed uh, early dark energy models, when you fit them to explain the H not and you know get H not up from the Planck value, whatever it is, sixty eight to 72, 73, right? They actually raise the spectral index. They have the spectral, some, there, there is even people claiming that the spectral index can be as high as one. Right. You know, so, but, but it seems to be that they basically go from point, the, the, the allowed regime, or rather favored regime goes from 0.96 to 97, up to 0.98 to 99. <laughs> Right. So the whole thing shifts to the right, you know, right. Toward, and then suddenly the plots that, that, you know, you may have thought were excluded that you have showed actually fit better than, for example, this Starovinsky thing. Yes, yes. So, so, of course, I'm taking this with a lot of reserve and a lot of, you know, skepticism because I don't really know how this is going to pan out. You know, maybe in the end they decided that, that there is some un, completely, completely unnoticed systematic so far with the cephates and, and, you know, you throw out all of this 
stuff about H naught, and then you go back to Planck, and then of course you know bicep as it is now is the ultimate you know statement about what inflation is like and so on. But that's gonna take some time, I think. Before yeah. that, you know, and oh, maybe it happens that there's early dark energy, and then we are up for a lot of surprise. I don't know. Well. We can always cook up models which will fit whatever the new constraints are. <laughs> but... Well, that's right. But the thing is, of course, at, at this point, you know, the, these these constraints are, um, I, I guess, they are very important to pay proper proper due to. Yes, yes, and yeah, and I completely agree that yeah, the current bounds on R at least mm -hmm. include uh, all single parameter models of inflation, all of the monomial. Uh, models of inflation have been ruled out so that you yeah, can practically i think that's right i mean practically they're, yeah. yeah so what we've been playing with here are basically uh two parameter models so basically right. Right. we always have the plateau which yeah. is uh, uh, flat enough so that we can respect r the, the bounce on r and then it, we just assume some parallel minimum just because that's a natural thing to do and uh, Basically, we we basically have a, a if you like a, a two parallel potential, which can be described by two parameters, uh, and uh, yeah, basically here the idea is that uh, the greater m is, uh, the closer you are uh, to the regime of a slower inflation along the uh, uh, along only one parallel, basically being inf uh, well inflating along the actual medium. And uh, that's why this region is excluded because the greater M is, the closer you are to monomial inflation. But the smaller M is, the, the, the further away you are from M Planck, uh, the closer you are to, to parameter inflation. And that's why you kind of respect these constraints. Uh, but that's just you know a, a, a phenomenological thing. But the point is that yeah, uh, single parameter models are ruled out. And now the, the most economical model of inflation is a two parameter model. Yeah, right. The word economical, of course, is the, 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 the key statement here. Yeah. You yes. know, economical by what standard? But yes, I understand. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a way of parameterizing your ignorance and you think it's better to have fewer parameters. And that's fair. That's fair. Oh, this is the best we can do at this, at this stage, at least. <laughs> Perhaps. I'm not sure. We'll see. <laughs> Wait. There's room for improvement, I agree. <laughs> well, you know, it's like saying that, 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 that you put it this way. I don't know, okay? You know, this this is kind of similar to saying that, you know, you like Occam's razor and therefore you postulate that the universe is the standard model plus one billiard ball for the dark matter plus one number for the cosmological constant. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's very economical. Okay. But it's hardly a theory or an explanation. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's okay. It's okay. You're right. I mean, it's a simple fit and at least, you know, you can... You can write it in the equations with as few inputs as you as you as you as you can afford, and then you can sort of check it. And so it's it, it's okay. I mean, you know, as long as you keep it, keep that in mind, but it's fine. Anyway, further questions, guys. So, so maybe I'll ask one more actually then, but more of a, you know, so where, where, where do you think this is taking, this is going now? Um, well, I mean, in some sense, you know, it's nice. You're developing tools that you can deploy to various theories that may come along and then use them, you know, as a way of checking, testing predictions and so on and so forth. And these tools are, it seems they're quite accurate. They're intricate. Okay, so one would expect that you can calculate things with uh, good precision and so on. But what's your sort of bird's eye view of this? Um, well, the hope is that uh, high frequency gravitational wave experiments will manage to catch up with the low frequency gravitational wave experiments. So basically, in addition to you know being able to measure gravitational waves or detect gravitational waves at like one millihertz, we might be able to attack gravitational waves at least at slightly higher frequencies, say, you know, greater than kilohertz. And then we'll start uh, probing or at least kind of, well, or even start excluding uh, 
high energy, uh, uh, high energy scale inflation. So inflation you know, which occurred at scales greater than you know 10 TV or or more. But for that, we need to start you know probing, well, start constraining stochastic rotation wave backgrounds at uh, the megahertz level. And uh, at this stage, uh, the high frequency rotation wave detectors are kind of lacking behind in terms of sensitivity. They're lacking behind the low frequency rotation wave detectors. So rotation waves are definitely uh, a promising avenue. Uh, the, the upcoming CMB experiments are might be also uh, helpful to some extent uh, because they they will provide a better constraint on on an effective uh, the number of additional relativistic degrees of freedom and uh, if you have a model of preheating uh, which produces a lot of uh, gravitational waves since you know gravitons are just extra relativistic degrees of freedom they might show up in an effective and uh, the the beauty of this measure is that it's uh, frequency independent. So even if we have preheating taking place at really, really high energies, so if inflation happened at say uh, 10 to 15 GeV just before the gut scale, and just below the gut scale, and uh, this scale kind of gives you a stochastic rotation of background of about a gigahertz, which is pretty much uh, uh, impossible to detect directly, it might still affect N effective. And N effective will be able to constrain a lot of. Uh, very violent uh, preheating uh, scenarios, uh, regardless of their en energy scale, just because they'll give rise to a lot of gravitational waves, which uh, will contribute to the N effective. Uh, uh, to N effective. And uh, basically, we're waiting for CMB st stage four to start improving the, you know, the uncertainties on N effective. So that's another kind of uh, way forward for this field. So basically, just compute the gravitational waves in pretty much. Uh, as many reheating scenarios as possible and hope that they might be constrained to remote route by CMB stage four. Yeah, that's what, what, what's, what what's the time? I think I know that Lisa is supposed to start thinking about actually having a detector kind of near the stage of launch around 2034, something like that, if I remember correctly. So that's 10, 15 years from now. I mean, is there... Uh, the, 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 there is, of course, the, the, the CMB experiments which will come on, I mean, the, the polarization searches and so on, that will come on earlier, but do you have yes. a, a, a kind of a time scale for some of these that, for these, let's say, intermediate gravity wavelengths that might actually be some of the most interesting regimes? Yeah, well, CMB stage four and Lightbird, yeah, they're basically kind of planted at least on a 10-year time scale or something like that. Right, like. right. Hopefully, right, right. within ten years or so, some of them at least will become will go online. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know about this. I'm not. No, that, right, right. Okay, well, that's fair. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that understand. Thank you. Additional questions, guys. Well, okay. If there is no more questions, then we can thank Kaloyan again and maybe convene this. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Of course. Thank you. Bye. Bye and take care and stay.